Hey developers, check out this really cool website I found. It's packed with amazing scroll effects, buttery smooth scrolling, beautiful text animations, and this one section that completely caught my eye. When you scroll, it automatically pins this card, scales it down, and splits it into three separate cards. Then, as you keep scrolling, all three cards flip over to reveal more information. It's such a clever and polished animation. Now, as you know, we've done lots of GSAP tutorials on this channel, so I couldn't resist recreating this effect myself. Check out what I built. It's almost identical to the original. So in this video, I'm going to walk you through exactly how I recreated this entire effect using Lennis for smooth scrolling and GSAP for all the animations. I'll break down every step and explain all the logic behind it. Let's dive in. Let's start with the HTML structure. This sets the stage for the entire scroll effect. First, we have a simple intro section with a headline, a nice way to set the mood. Next comes the main sticky section. This is where the magic happens. Inside, there's a header and a card container with three cards. Each card has a front side with an image and a back side with a number and description. This two-sided structure is what allows that smooth flip animation later on. Finally, there's an outro section to close the experience. At the bottom, we include our animation tools, GSAP, Scroll Trigger, and Lennis for smooth scrolling plus our own custom script. The stage is set, and now we're ready to animate. Let's walk through the CSS step by step. This is where we set the visual stage for everything you're about to see animate. First, I've brought in a beautiful serif font called Instrument Serif, which gives the whole design an elegant editorial feel. I set up color variables for the project, a dark background, light text, and three distinct card colors. This makes it easy to adjust the colors later if needed. Then, a quick reset to remove default margins and padding. And I applied border box sizing so padding doesn't break our layouts. Each section is set to full viewport height with a dark background, giving us that spacious, full-screen scroll effect. The intro and outro sections are simple, centered text to frame the experience. Now the sticky section. It's centered with flexbox. Notice the sticky header. It's positioned near the top, and its heading starts invisible and moved down slightly. That's because we'll animate it into view with GSAP later. The card container is where the real magic starts. It has perspective set to 1000 pixels. That's what makes the 3D flip effect possible. It's also shifted down a bit initially, so we can animate it upward when scrolling begins. Each card is flexible with an aspect ratio of five by seven to keep proportions consistent. The transform style and back face visibility properties are key. They allow us to flip the card and reveal the backside cleanly. The front of the card holds an image. The back is rotated 180 degrees by default, so it's hidden until we flip the card. Each back has a unique gradient background and a centered number and title. I also gave the first and last cards rounded edges on opposite sides, so when they sit side by side, they look like one cohesive component. Finally, there's a responsive block for smaller screens. Below 1000 pixels, the layout switches to a vertical column, cards become full width, and I remove the initial transform so everything is visible and stacked neatly on mobile. All of this styling is built with animation in mind transforms, opacities, perspective. Everything is prepped so that with a few lines of GSAP, the whole scene will come to life on scroll. The stage is visually set. Now let's make it move. First, we wait for the page to be completely loaded and ready before we start running any of our animation code. Then the very first thing we do with GSAP is register the scroll trigger plugin. Think of this as telling GSAP, hey, we're going to use scroll-based animations in this project, so get ready for that. Now let's set up buttery smooth scrolling with a library called Lennis. First, I create a new Lennis instance. Think of this as giving the browser a smoother, more controlled scroll engine. Next, I connect Lennis to Scroll Trigger. Every time Lennis scrolls, it automatically updates Scroll Trigger so our animations stay perfectly in sync. Then I link GSAP's animation ticker to Lennis's request animation frame. This ensures our animations run at the same smooth pace as the scrolling.
Finally, I set GSAP's lag smoothing to zero, which removes any animation delay and keeps everything feeling instant and responsive. With just these four lines, we've transformed the default browser scroll into a silky smooth experience that's perfectly tuned for our animations. Now let's grab references to the key elements we're going to animate. First, I get the card container. That's the parent holding all three cards. Then I get the sticky header text, the one that says three pillars with one purpose. And finally, I get all three individual cards so we can control each one separately. I also set up two simple state flags, one to track whether the gap animation between cards has finished, and another for when the card flip has completed. These flags act like little memory switches. They help us remember where we are in the animation sequence and prevent things from triggering multiple times. With these references and state trackers ready, we're all set to start building our animation timelines. Now let's create our first animation timeline. This one handles the gap effect where the cards separate from each other. I'm creating a timeline called Gap TL and setting it to paused mode because we want to control when it plays based on the user's scroll position. This timeline does four things simultaneously, all starting at the same time, and each lasting one second with a smooth easing curve. First, it adds 30 pixels of gap between the cards, creating that visual separation. Second, it moves the first card 30 pixels to the left. Third, it moves the third card 30 pixels to the right. And finally, it changes the border radius of all three cards to 20 pixels, giving each card those nice rounded corners. Together, these animations transform the cards from one cohesive unit into three distinct, separated elements. This creates that beautiful moment where the single card layout splits apart to reveal the individual cards. Now let's build our second timeline, the flip animation that reveals the back of each card. I'm creating another paused timeline called Flip TL, which will trigger later based on the scroll position. This timeline has two main parts that happen at the same time, both starting at position zero. The first part rotates every card 180 degrees around their Y axis creating that 3D flip effect. Each flip lasts one second with a smooth easing curve, and I've added a slight stagger of 0.1 seconds between each card, so they flip one after the other in a natural sequence. The second part adds extra depth to the outer cards. For the first and third cards, I'm moving them up by 30 pixels and tilting them slightly. The first card tilts 15 degrees counterclockwise, and the third card tilts 15 degrees clockwise. This creates that beautiful, cascading card flip effect where the cards don't just rotate, but also lift and tilt for a more dynamic, three-dimensional feel. Together, these two animations transform our separated cards into a stunning, interactive reveal of their backside content. Now let's dive into the main animation setup with the init animations function. This is where we make our animations responsive meaning they'll work perfectly on both desktop and mobile devices. I start by creating a match media instance from GSAP. Think of this as setting up a smart system that applies different animation rules based on screen size. For small screens, anything under 1000 pixels wide, we're keeping things simple. Inside this mobile section, we'll just make sure our styles are reset and the cards are stacked nicely without any complex scroll triggers. For desktop screens, 1000 pixels and wider, we're going to set up the full pinned scroll behavior. This is where all our complex animations will live, with the sticky section, the card splitting, and the flips. The match media system automatically handles switching between these two setups when the screen size changes. So on mobile, users get a straightforward, stacked layout. On desktop, they get the full cinematic scroll experience. This responsive approach ensures everyone gets the best possible experience. Now let's talk about how we handle screen resizing. First, I immediately call the init animations function when the page loads, so everything is set up from the start. But what happens when someone resizes their browser window or rotates their device? We need to recalculate everything, because screen dimensions affect our animations. That's where this resize handler comes in. I'm using a technique called debouncing, 
which means we wait 220 milliseconds after the user stops resizing before we take action. Why wait? Because during resizing, the browser fires dozens of resize events per second, and we don't want to recalculate our animations that many times, so we set a timer. And every time a new resize event comes in, we clear the old timer and start a new one. Only when 220 milliseconds pass without any new resize events do we actually run our code. Then we reinitialize all our animations with the new screen dimensions and refresh scroll trigger so everything stays perfectly in sync. This creates that seamless experience where whether you're resizing your browser or switching between portrait and landscape on a tablet, our animations always adapt perfectly. It's that final touch of polish that makes everything feel professional and robust. Now let's look at an important helper function called set defaults. This function does a clean reset of our animation elements and states, which is especially useful when we resize the screen or restart the animation. First, it removes any inline styles we've added to the cards, the card container, and the sticky header. This ensures we're starting with a clean slate. Then, it resets our two animation timelines, pausing them at the very beginning. And finally, it resets our two state flags, marking both the gap animation and the flip animation as not completed. This function acts like a safety net, making sure everything is back to square one before we set up our animations again. Let's break down the update header function. This function is in charge of animating the sticky header text based on how far you've scrolled through the pinned section. It receives a progress value from zero to one, representing where we are in the scroll journey. Now I want the header to appear smoothly between 10% and 35% of the scroll progress. So if the progress is between 0.1 and 0.35, I use GSAP's map range utility to convert that progress into a new range from zero to one. Then I map that new value to control two things, the vertical position and the opacity of the header. At the start of this range, the header is 40 pixels down and fully transparent. By the end, it's at its normal position and fully visible. If we haven't reached 10% yet, I keep the header hidden and shifted down. And once we're past 35%, the header stays in place and fully visible. This creates that beautiful controlled fade in effect that guides the viewer's attention at just the right moment. Next up is the update card width function. This controls how the card container shrinks as you scroll. I want the container to gradually narrow from 75% of the screen width down to 60%, creating a more focused composition as you progress. This narrowing happens during the first 35% of the scroll journey. So if the progress is less than or equal to 0.35, I use GSAP's map range utility to smoothly calculate the width percentage, starting at 75% when progress is zero, and ending at 60% when progress reaches 0.35. Once we pass that 35% mark, I simply set the container width to stay at 60% for the rest of the animation. This subtle shrinking effect helps draw attention to the cards, making them feel more centered and important as the story unfolds. Now let's look at the handle gap animation function. This function decides when to play or reverse the gap animation that separates the three cards. It checks the scroll progress and triggers the animation when we cross the 45% mark. If the progress is 45% or more, and the gap animation hasn't been played yet, it starts the timeline and marks it as completed. But here's the clever part. If the user scrolls back up and the progress goes below 45%, but the animation was already played. It reverses the timeline, smoothly bringing the cards back together, and it resets the completion flag. So if the user scrolls down again, the animation can play once more. This creates that seamless interactive experience where the cards separate as you scroll down and come back together if you scroll back up, all perfectly synchronized with your scroll position. The flag system ensures the animation doesn't keep triggering repeatedly, but only when actually crossing that threshold. Finally, we have the handle flip animation function. This controls the dramatic moment when all three cards flip over to reveal their back sides. I set the trigger point at 70% of the scroll progress, 
which happens after the cards have already separated, creating a nice sequence of events. When the progress reaches 70% and the flip hasn't been completed yet, we play the flip timeline. The timeline animates each card to rotate 180 degrees around their y-axis, with a slight stagger between them for that beautiful cascading effect. But just like with the gap animation, if the user scrolls back up below 70%, we reverse the entire flip timeline, smoothly returning the cards to their front-facing state. The flag system ensures we don't get stuck in a loop of playing and reversing, giving us precise control over the animation state. This creates that satisfying interactive experience where the cards respond perfectly to your scrolling, flipping when you go down and unflipping when you go back up, as if they're physically reacting to your movement. Together with the gap animation, this creates the complete story, cards separate, then flip to reveal their content, all in perfect sync with the user's scroll. Inside our main init animations function, the first thing we do is clean house. This is a crucial safety step, especially when dealing with responsive layouts and potential screen resizes. First, we get all existing scroll trigger instances and kill them. This prevents old scroll triggers from stacking up or conflicting with new ones when we reinitialize. Then, we call our set defaults function, which resets all our elements back to their starting styles and resets our animation timelines and state flags. Think of this as starting with a completely clean slate every time we set up our animations. This ensures there are no leftover inline styles or animation states that could interfere with our new setup. This two-step cleanup is essential for creating reliable, repeatable animations that work perfectly every time, whether on initial load or after a screen resize. Inside the mobile media query section, where the screen width is 999 pixels or less, we keep things intentionally simple. First, we call set defaults to ensure the header, card container, and cards are reset to their original, unanimated styles. This removes any inline styles that might have been added during the desktop animations, giving us a clean starting point for mobile. Then, we return an empty function, which serves as the cleanup for this match media scope. Since we aren't setting up any complex scroll triggers or animations on mobile, there's nothing specific to clean up when the screen size changes back to desktop. This approach ensures that on smaller screens, users get a straightforward static layout without any scroll-triggered animations, which is often more performant and user-friendly on mobile devices. The empty return function is a way of telling GSAP's match media system, we didn't set up anything that needs special cleanup, so just move on. This keeps our mobile experience clean, fast, and focused on content rather than complex animations. Now let's look inside the desktop section where all the animation magic happens. I'm creating a scroll trigger instance that targets our sticky section. Here's what each configuration does. The trigger starts when the top of the sticky section hits the top of the viewport. The endpoint is set to four times the window height, giving us a nice long scroll distance to work with. I'm setting scrub to one, which creates that beautiful smooth link between scroll position and animation progress. Pin is set to true, so the entire sticky section stays fixed during the animation. And pin spacing ensures we maintain the proper layout space, so there's no jumping or overlapping. Now the real brains are in the on update callback. Every time the scroll position changes, this function runs and gives us the current progress from zero to one. I break down the responsibilities into our four helper functions. Update header handles the fade in of our headline. Update card width smoothly shrinks the container. Handle gap animation separates the cards. And handle flip animation flips them over. Finally, I return a cleanup function that kills this scroll trigger if we switch back to mobile, preventing any conflicts or memory issues. This setup gives us that perfect synchronized scroll animation where every movement triggers a beautiful visual response. And that's how we build that stunning scroll-driven card animation with Lenny's and GSAP. If you enjoyed this tutorial, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more creative web animations. Let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next. And as always, happy coding.